Last week on Fear and Faith, I examined the placebo effect and proved just how powerful belief can be. I gave a number of people a fake drug, which was no more than a sugar pill, and by getting them to believe in it, they made dramatic changes in their lives. Tonight, I'm going to investigate what I think could be the biggest placebo of them all. God. I'm going to use experiments to show how religious experience can be explained by psychology. There's something definitely in here. Oh. And then I'll put that theory to the test by using that knowledge to give an atheist an experience of a religious conversion. I'm going to do my first experiment on the audience who don't know they're being filmed. Right, we're not filming at the moment, are we? Um, in that case, before we start... Is my, my mic's... Yeah, okay. Before we start then... I, and I, we're just, I'm going to do this without filming. You've all got, I hope, or we ask you to print out a photograph of a loved one. Hopefully these are prints and it wouldn't matter if they got damaged. That's the idea. I have here... This, um, this is extraordinary. This is a genuine satanic rite um, based on an 11th century manuscript, and it is, it's the right that people read out declaring their allegiance to Satan. It's extraordinary these things uh, exist. And um, the idea is that you get his protection in your life, but then you're subject to his torments and, and whims for eternity after that. As part of it, what you do is you would stab a... It would, back in the day, it would have been a portrait, but nowadays they do it with photographs. You stab uh, a photograph of um, someone that you love. You read this out, and this is declaring your allegiance to Satan. So before we start filming, does anybody want to do that? Just out of interest, anybody up for doing that? So that's that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven out of 160 of you. Um, what's your name? Sam. Sam. Do you want to come do it? Thank you, Sam. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Who's in the photograph? Uh, it's my twin sister, Lucy. Your twin sister, Lucy. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the reader, that's you, must place a representation of their loved one onto the table and light a black candle. So would you light the candle for me? Lovely. Wine is poured into the chalice. The reader must take a sip of the wine. And then read the first part of the rite. To master Satan himself, the faceless inferno, I offer my eternal soul forever to suffer in damnation, persecuted in torment for all time by your infernal princes Baphomet, Thoth and Set. To appease thine hunger, I give you my soul in return for your protection during this earthbound existence. Uh, Red is the dagger, plunges it into the photograph. Into your sister, please. Again, again, again. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Well Thank then, you. Sam. And good luck with the rest of your life. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> what was of interest to me there, and by the way, Sam, we were filming that. I said we weren't filming it because I didn't want you just to be playing up for the cameras. I want you to do that and genuinely want to do it as opposed to just want to be on TV. Are you happy with that? Okay, good. Um, what was interesting to me was that only 11 out of 160 of you actually put your hand up. Out of, out of interest, how many of you actually believe in the devil and that stabbing a photograph could have any physical effect on the person in the photograph? Two? Three? Couple of... Four? Five? Okay. Six? Yeah, and you are very... You're largely an audience of, um, of, of, of unbelievers and, and, and skeptics as well, largely. So, uh, the fact that so few of these people offered to perform the right does show that we're all born with an inbuilt, hardwired tendency to believe. Now tonight I'm going to take you through the reasons why I think we develop religious belief and put them to the test by giving an atheist a religious conversion. Welcome to the second part of Fear and Faith. <laughs> Good evening. 
Early this week, I took a small group of bright, rationally-minded atheists and agnostics and put them in the crypt of an old church and asked them to sit in the dark, alone, for 15 minutes. But before they entered the crypt, I told them that there had been stories of hauntings there and that I was interested in a report of their experiences in the dark. With this experiment, I'm aiming to show you how just the suggestion of the supernatural can bring out a tendency to believe in things that don't exist, even if you're an atheist. Josh, Haley, and Tom have been placed in a pitch-black crypt under a church. The only other things in the room with them are our infrared cameras. Shit. It's cold. It's so dark. feels like I'm not alone. I can't see anything at all. Oh, God. I just think I can see things moving around me. I don't think I can do it. I can't do this. It feels like somebody's stood in a corner. <sighs> oh, God. Oh, oh. It's like moving around the wall. Ah, it feels like it was just to my right. Oh. Okay, I can see if something in front of me. What the f <laughs> No, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't do this. No, no, lots of things that like faded outlines of, of, of people. There's something definitely in here. It was like a white, like, um, I don't know, a girl? Jesus. I've got the biggest fear of things behind me. Do you want to come out, come out for a second? Yeah. It was weird because I kept seeing things. I'm sure I saw a round thing that looked almost like a head. It kind of looked like a nun, but no face. Couldn't see a face as quick as I looked. It just sort of looked like that shape with nothing in the middle. As soon as I sat down in that chair, it was like gone. And I was like, something is behind me. That thing just didn't want me there. And I think I just outstayed my welcome. <laughs> and I randomly saw this this figure in front of me, this girl. It was just kind of an outline. The face was kind of just blank. It was kind of transparent, like see-through. There was something else in that room. I gave them an idea, nothing more. And from it, their minds created an experience which for them was very real indeed. They all sensed a presence because as shown by our satanic rite, we're all born with an inbuilt, hardwired tendency to believe. The people in that vault reacted in the way they did purely because I planted the idea it might be haunted. And remember, these are rational non-believers. The fourth person, though, who went in had a rather different reaction. Meet Natalie. I don't feel particularly freaked out, really. Um, there goes another train. I think it might be a district line. feel quite safe, really. So unlike the others, Natalie was underwhelmed, to say the least. Natalie is an atheist. Moreover, she's a stem cell researcher, a scientist working in an area that many feel is deeply incompatible with religious belief. Our initial research revealed her to be deeply skeptical. So I felt she was the most challenging candidate to try to give the experience of a religious conversion. Now, like Natalie, I'm an atheist, and as you'll see tonight, I don't think a belief in God has to be foolish. I think it's probably unnecessary, but that's not the same thing as being stupid. And nor would I try to presume to undo your belief if you, if you happen to believe. And this is, this is an important point. Clearly, faith, which we've all been taught to understand and respect, comes in a variety of forms and generally very real to the people that hold it. But we're undoubtedly psychological creatures and all susceptible to manipulation and the way that our brains have become wired over time. Okay, so back to Natalie and my attempt to convert her. I wanted to find out how skeptical she is about God and more importantly, how big this challenge would be to give her this conversion. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Natalie. Here we come. So, how was the crypt? When were you last in church? Some christening or wedding no longer than a couple of years ago, I think, yeah. When did you last go for devotional reasons? I've never been for devotional reasons, yeah. more ceremonial. 
Yeah, so you're, you're an atheist, are you? I take yeah, it like me. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and you're a stem cell scientist. Mm -hmm. How long have you done that for? Oof, nearly six, seven years, actually, yeah. Can you ever imagine being a believer? For me, that would be literally last resort. You know, mm. there's other things, there's self belief for my, you know, that would help me get through bad times, you know. So yeah. never, never have been, can't ever see no. yourself being a believer? No. No. Didn't cool. So here's the challenge. I'm taking someone who is a staunch atheist and scientist with a skeptical, analytical mind and trying to give her a religious experience in order to show how religious belief comes from us, not from the divine. And these facts are not the only things working against me. Usually in the case of a conversion, Natalie would be searching for some sort of answer to life's problems, but she's quite happy with her life, so I won't have that advantage. Neither am I the preacher at a big religious rally, which can easily create a hyper-suggestibility and ensure that large numbers of people convert every night. I want this to be a real and profound experience for her, and not just something she thinks I've talked her into. So I'll have to do it indirectly, without mentioning God at all, so she doesn't attribute it to me. And I'll give myself 15 minutes to do it. Join me after the break to find out how I'm aiming to give Natalie this experience. Tonight, in Fear and Faith, I'm investigating whether we could have created God in our own minds. Is there really a divine power? Or can our experience of religion be explained by psychology alone? So my challenge tonight is to try and give Natalie, an atheist, a strong and powerful religious experience. And I'm going to do this through a 15-minute long conversation with her. And during that time, I won't be mentioning God at all, but I will be relying on the knowledge, which I will explain here, that can be used to bring about a religious experience. And to show you how the very idea of a supernatural presence affects our lives, I will uh, demonstrate an interesting test using this garish object. There you go, eBay. Now you probably know what this is, it's a buzz wire game, the idea being you have to move that, every time I touch it, it buzzes, you die and a little light comes on. And uh, we gave this to a few of you to try sometime before filming, and you know, it's a, it's a tricky thing to do. I think. Well, can you put your hands up if you, there's a group over here that we're, we're doing it, one, two, three, four, excellent. What's your name, sir? Connor. Connor. So I think you, Connor, you got, uh, I think you registered seven buzzes. Seven. You find it easy, difficult? It's quite tricky, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite tricky, yeah. Excellent. Um, just nice to meet you, by the way. Come, hey. come up here just for a second for me. So, um, so we left you alone in a room uh, to do this, and we didn't let you know that we were filming. Um, and you were asked every time you made a mistake to register it on, uh, on, there was a counter that he had to press every time he, he, he made a buzzer. So it was, it was up to him to register his mistakes. And uh, so let's see Connor having a go at this secretly film. Remember, he registered seven mistakes. So the number there on the left is gonna be the actual number of buzzes, and the number on the monitor is how many get registered. That's a one. And at the moment, he's being supervised by our producer, Dave, uh, just to Oh yeah, Dave's pressing the counter just to establish what's going on, but then Dave will get called out, leaving Connor to continue on his own. Okay. He's being trusted with the job of registering his mistakes. And note that yellow armchair to the right, that'll be important later. Generously registering a mistake. Eight. Nine. Ten. There he goes. Eighteen. Actual number 18, uh, seven registered. It's a bit awkward there, cheating. <laughs> Can you explain yourself? No. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for that. Um, right. I'll ask you to sit back down. There's a, there's a good reason um, why this happened. Thank you. Um, I can explain it. Actually, three out of four of you that did it. Would you put your hands up again for me, the four of you that did it? Three out of four of you uh, 
cheated. And uh, so it wasn't just you, Connor. And, and here is your group. I'll show you your group. So Connor's up there on the left. We also have Amanda. Uh, she's a cheat. And uh, Jack is also a cheat. So any, uh, any friends or family of, of these people that are watching now, just bear in mind, they're probably like people that you probably shouldn't trust. I'll just say that. There they are, all of them cheating. But we were hoping they would. We actually made it very easy for them to do so. We told them that by doing well at this, it would lead to their involvement in the show, which, <laughs> in a sense, it did. Um, however, there was a second group, another group. Would you put your hands up? You're the other group that did this. Excellent. Thank you very much. None of these people cheated. Not one of them. Yet three out of four of your group did. Now, this group was told exactly the same things, including the fact that doing well would lead to their involvement on the show. But they were also given an extra piece of information. This chair is a, it's for a new show we're doing called Antiques Ghost Show, uh, um, where people bring in antiques that they think are haunted or have some sort of possession about them. Apparently it's worth loads and a woman died in it and still sits in it to this day. It's, I know, they're filming with it later on, it's mm, weird. Antiques Ghost Show. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe you fell for that. This is based on an experiment by a psychologist called Jesse Baring and his colleagues. Once the idea is sown that there could be some sort of presence in the room, something happens. Hardly anyone cheats. Any of you actually believe that the chair was haunted? No. None of them believe the chair was haunted. Yet despite that, the idea is enough to significantly affect our behavior. This experiment shows that if people are led to imagine a supernatural presence, they will then act in a more moral way. And this reaction comes from deep within us not from the force itself, because the chair wasn't really haunted. There's a likely evolutionary reason for this, Bering suggests. As our ancestors developed language, it also meant that they could gossip. And through gossip, your reputation could be damaged, which meant you could be outcast because others would discuss your misdeeds. And that makes you someone to be avoided. And it could put you in danger, and ultimately it makes you less likely to reproduce. So we learned moral behavior to keep us all happily ticking along together and to up our survival chances. Now, the safest way of ensuring this conformity and therefore increasing our survival chances would be to believe there was some divine presence that might still catch us out when we thought our peers weren't around. So our invention of an all-seeing supernatural force like God to moderate our actions and us being on our best behavior just because we're told there's a haunted chair in the room, it's part of the hard wiring of our brains. It once helped us with our survival chances. And it most likely explains why even atheists often betray a tendency to give purpose and meaning to events in their life that really they shouldn't given that they don't believe there's a supernatural force or agency at work. So we've got this supernatural all-seeing force over us, but how do we make it a reality in our lives? We need to personify it. We hope that this force is strong and wise and loving and all the attributes found in a classic father figure. The first technique I'm going to use on Natalie is to elicit feelings of this powerful father figure, which later on I can get her to attach to the idea of God. So during my 15-minute conversation with Natalie, I'm going to have her create the feeling of being loved by a perfect father, and then I'm going to associate that feeling with a trigger so I can bring it back whenever I want. What's your relationship like with your dad? He's brilliant. He, yeah. he is. Not, without, you know, putting him on a pedestal, he's sort of my hero. Is he? Yeah. That's such a lovely, lovely thing. Because a lot of people, I guess, don't, don't have that. When you were little, when you were tiny, the same? But basically, when, when I was a child, Dad was the came home seven from work. So if you know if he was ever naughty, he'd be like, wait till Dad gets home. <laughs> oh, so see, yeah. he was seen as the more you know, disciplinarian. So just as a thought exercise, if you imagine that your dad didn't have to go to work when you were little, that he had nothing to do other than be completely devoted to you, how does that make you feel? I've now started tapping my fingers on the table whilst talking to Natalie. I'm associating in Natalie's unconscious the emotion she's feeling with that tapping. Then later I can trigger them again by tapping in the same way moments before her religious experience. How does that make you feel? Mm, makes me feel special. I feel really honored and yeah, just special. Yeah. By her trance-like expression, Natalie is showing signs of unconscious processing and is absorbed in the idea of a perfect father figure. And now these feelings are in place, I'll get her to attach them to God later in the process. 
So once we start to imagine the presence of God, it's a very small step to start believing that he can think or that he holds power and, and, and possibly that he has a plan for our lives. And if we look for it, our brains are wired to find it. We apply what's called a theory of mind. It's the ability to step inside other people's heads. And the core of religious belief comes down to our idea that God has a mind and therefore a plan for us. So we create the idea of an agency, that God takes an interest in us and is pulling strings in our lives. So I'm going to use this innate tendency to see an agency at work to help give Natalie her conversion experience. I'm going to do it by asking questions and then subtly suggesting the idea that a plan could be at work. What about, um, have you ever had things in your life, things that went wrong or, you know, things that didn't work out as they were supposed to or mistakes that you made? relationship but oh, okay. you know that that's you well know, no completely no that's a fairly sound yeah. thing so at some point there has been a relationship mm. that hasn't worked out brilliantly of course but when you look back are you more able to understand now so why that happened what, if, um, is it like a bit of a, like a grand plan to, if that well, yeah it allowed me to live the rest of my life the way I wanted it to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. what is that I'm getting Natalie to see that the things that have gone wrong could have happened for a reason and were part of a bigger plan now she needs to connect that with feelings of being cherished and a sense of awe and wonder. Is it, where, where do you sort of physically feel it, if you, if you think about it? Tell me, does it well, make... my heart, because, you know, the emotion that you feel when you're hugged, it you know, starts off in my chest and my heart, because it's, yeah, just to feel so safe and protected. Did you go on holiday a lot when you were, when you were little? Yeah. yeah. One thing we never did, which I always, always wanted to do, was um, go up a mountain top and have that feeling of standing at the top. That feeling of absolute awe. What is awe to you then? What is that kind of, is, is, it, is it that, if you think um, about it? For me, awe is looking at a full night sky yeah. of stars and to, to know that each pinpoint isn't just a little speck of light, it's a planet or a sun, to, to know it's all up there. And I think actually those are two things that we very, be very rare to get both those feelings together and combined into one. We've reached a crucial stage in our conversation. After discussing and provoking feelings of both being cherished and a sense of awe, I'm using my hands to physically combine both emotions, and this will help me generate these emotions simultaneously in Natalie during her religious experience. Very, it'd be very rare to get both those feelings together and combined into one sort of uh, one image of kind of both intense awe and feeling of. Everything is so much more than me, and I'm tiny, and at the same time, absolutely just being, being cherished and sort of and held in that. But as well. in a way, that sort of the feeling of being cherished makes it even more special to know that you are insignificant, and yet someone's so still willing to cherish you that much. It's like, well, I must be that bit special. <laughs> With over half of my 15 minutes gone, I feel I am close to giving Natalie the experience of a religious conversion. After the break, I want you at home to join us here in an experiment. So before we come back, can you please do the following three things at home? Firstly, please close all the windows in the room that you're watching TV in. Secondly, please turn up the bass function if you have one on your TV set or connect it to any stereo or subwoofer system if you have one. Thirdly, finally, this is a bit of an odd one, please remove any scent of mint that you might have in the room. If so, if your gran has just chomped on another extra strong mint, please get her to wait in the garden for a little while. Thank you. See you in a couple of minutes when I will explain all. Tonight I'm exploring whether God could be nothing more than an illusion, a belief in something that isn't there. Using a number of experiments, I'm investigating whether religious experience could be explained not by the divine, but by psychology. And in doing so, I hope to prove how even atheists have a hardwired capacity to believe. Never have been, can't ever see yourself being a believer. Welcome back. Uh, I'm now going to illustrate the next step we're going to take in the journey to give Natalie a powerful religious experience. So, I have here a little bottle of a very powerful peppermint oil. When I open this, it's strong enough that the smell will permeate the room. Obviously, it's going to be fainter for those of you at the back. It'll be fairly faint by the time it reaches all of you. But uh, what I want you to do 
as soon as you smell it, is to put your hand up. And the point of this is to see how a scent moves around a room, because it's not quite in the way that you might think it will. So the moment you smell it, it will only be faint. Please put your hand up. Anyone else? Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. You can drop your hands now. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, so here's the twist. Uh, the smell was not, in fact, generated by the peppermint oil. That is not peppermint oil. That's actually just water. There you go, Connor, if you smell that. Nothing in there, is there? It's just water. You smell anything at all? Nothing. No. <clears throat> Nothing at all. And that will relax you quite nicely. <laughs> <laughs> See me afterwards. <laughs> the smell was actually generated by a sound wave. If you transmit a sound wave at 18.98 hertz into a contained space, such as we've done with you guys here, there are sort of hidden speakers, black speakers there, there's one there, one over there, and one just there that are transmitting the sound wave into a contained space. Um, if you do that, it resonates. The sound will resonate with a very small part of the brain responsible for smell, and it gives a lot of people, not everybody of course, but a large number of people, a definite sensation of smelling something sort of fresh and minty. And the fun thing is, this can also be done through the television set. So, we're gonna try this now. I will give you instructions in a moment. And if you're good at this, and you do smell it, because not everybody can, and particularly if you're on Twitter, will you please let us know uh, by tweeting using the hashtag Darren Smells. Hashtag Hashtag Darren smells. Good, thank you. So, we have been testing this over the past few weeks and have found out the following measures make it work better. So, as I said before the break, please close any windows. Right, now this isn't obviously to actually keep the smell in per se, but it allows the sound wave to bounce back into the room. Uh, secondly, if you can, turn up the bass on your TV set or speakers. If you have a subwoofer, turn it up as well. It'll still work without this, but it does seem that it can be more effective uh, if the bass is turned up. Thirdly, remove any existing scent uh, of mint that you might have in the room. Okay. Next, come close to your TV. You need to be about six feet from it if possible. You need to sit, please, not stand, and relax. Your brain needs to be relaxed, so just avoid all other distractions. So please do these things for me now. And when the mint picture comes up on your screen, turn your TV volume to full. And when the mint picture goes away, you can drop the volume again. Now, about 10% of you, interestingly, might get more of a citrusy smell than a minty smell, but please do tell us and tell us on Twitter if you have that. Are you ready? Then let's begin. Turn your volume up now. There you go. So please let us know if you could smell anything, mint, citrus, or just cock, as I'm sure most of you will be tweeting as I speak. Um, or maybe it was the whiff of something more organic you picked up on. <laughs> Pile of poo. Uh, <laughs> the sound wave doesn't exist. If you smell peppermint, then welcome to the placebo effect. It's nothing more than suggestion and expectation. Research indicates that if you smelled it, you're probably more creative, open, and intelligent than those who did not. And if you didn't smell it, it probably means you are more critically minded and less prone to obvious flattery. <laughs> but it's precisely this expectation and suggestion that I'm working with during my attempt to give Natalie her religious experience using purely psychological techniques. I suppose also you're working with placebos at the moment, aren't you, with the stem cell research, mm. which is... Um, an area that really interests me in you. The show before this show that's going out now is actually about placebos. But there were a small number of people that just weren't going to quite embrace it. They were a bit more skeptical about it. And that was really interesting, I found, because what would make it work and be of real benefit to these people was to actually dispel that and completely, completely embrace this experience. Which I suppose is what a leap of faith is, isn't it? What do you think applying for this show? <laughs> It's one of the first things I've ever done that 
I didn't know what the end result would be. Yes. It, this is literally for faith because you apply and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to get picked. Yeah. You don't know what they're going to do with you if you get picked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a whole, you know, few months of don't know, don't know, can't plan, can't control. I am. So some people see me as a control freak because I've never done anything without knowing what the end result or the conclusion would be. Right. Yeah. So this was a new thing. Yeah. It was yeah. a new thing. Thought, so yeah. you took a bit of a leap. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Now that I've suggested to Natalie that faith can be a positive thing, all the elements I need are in place for her conversion moment. Now, if I wanted her to continue to believe in God, which I don't, she would need to start looking for evidence in her life to support that belief. And this is vital for maintaining an identity as a believer. When we think something is true, we look for anything which will confirm it to us. We find patterns in randomness. Now, I'm going to show you something here with the audience, but you can play along at home too. Take a look at these photos courtesy of Professor Richard Wiseman. So, picture of a, uh, a young girl, cruel victim of a custard pie attack. <laughs> but if you look at there is something slightly odd in the picture. I don't know if you can work this out. If you look behind her, can you see that? What is that? Can you see it? There is, yeah, it looks like a weird sort of homunculus or little goblin or tiny sort of man's face. If you look at the bricks behind him, you can see it actually would be oddly too small for a man. Um, looking over the wall. Uh, what about this one? Take a look at this. Can you see? Now this is a bit more difficult to spot. This is a car. Notice there is nobody in the car. It's empty. Can you see anything weird in this one? Face in the wing mirror. Exactly. Well done. Nicely spotted. No one in the car yet. A creepy reflection of what appears to be a woman in the wing mirror. So let's just go back to the, um, the girl there. Yeah, so if you take a look at it, you can see, yes, it does look like a face, but you can also, if you just uh, squinted it in the right way, work out that it's also just leaves, isn't it? It's just leaves and light and shadow. But we turn that random interplay of light and leaves into a face. And this is a really interesting thing. This desire to find patterns in randomness, or pareidolia as it's called, is probably the biggest contributor to supernatural belief. Randomness is not a comfortable thing for us to deal with. As our brain whizzes to make sense of things that make no sense, we fall prey to just seeing things that aren't there. I wanted to see how this desire to make sense out of randomness could play out in someone's life, so I asked people to apply for a TV show called Intervention, and Emma here was one of those people, and I arranged to meet up with her to explain more. I've asked Emma to meet me at this cafe where I'm going to explain to her the premise of my new show. In Intervention, I'll be using actors who will intervene in Emma's everyday life in order to teach her things that she can take and use in a positive way. Hi, can I get you a cold drink at all? Uh, water would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs> Hi, Emma. Hi, Hello. Darren. How are you doing? Darren, nice to see nice you. Nice to meet you. I would like you to take part in my new show, if you're up for it, and it's called Intervention. <laughs> we are going to set up interventions in your life. We're going to make things happen to you. Now, most of them will be fairly subtle and natural, some of them maybe less so. The point of the show is to teach you something but that I think you'll genuinely benefit from and, and, and we'll get something out of it. And to prove how easy it is for me to manipulate the world around you, the guy over there on the bench is going to spill your water. Bugger up! No, no, don't worry. Are you all right? <laughs> I'll get you another one. It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, we'll be filming the whole thing on hidden cameras, and we're very good with hidden cameras, so you won't spot them. You will okay. not spot them, so don't <laughs> drive yourself mad trying to find them. No, I won't. Just <laughs> we'll be using actors. We will be um, involving people that are very close to you and people that aren't close to you. And all I'll ask you to do as it goes along is to make a video diary and okay. send this to us. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Have a really interesting fortnight. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Emma. Cheers. So there's one thing I haven't mentioned to Emma. I won't be doing anything. We won't be secretly filming. We won't involve her family and friends. We won't employ any actors. But the mere idea that I am doing something is hopefully enough for her to start to look out for signs of my involvement or this agency looking over her. And once she gets that in her head, she'll find positive results for herself without any intervention from me. Her video diaries over the course of the next two weeks show her revealing all the things that she thinks we might have set up in order to teach her something valuable. I had to pop into Sainsbury's uh, just to pick up a few bits. And I, I saw her like a cheapy pair of slippers. And as I tried them on, a guy came around the corner and like kicked my Converse's across, <laughs> across the clothes aisle. 
I walked across the car park to get to my flat and a guy walked past me and we literally just stared at each other. One thing I wish maybe I did do was just smile a bit more. A young guy came running up to me, waving this £10 note at me. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry, but I've just uh, found this. It must have come from you. Have you dropped it? So these little events are getting me thinking a lot more now than what perhaps, you know, I would have had I not been doing these diaries. The penny dropped. I'm thinking this is about an intervention in me and my life. You know, I've established what things are that I'd like to change, I guess. Is it now up to me to change that? Hi, Emma. It sounded like by the end of it, you were starting to get a sense that there was maybe a little more going on than, than we'd yeah. said. So even though I did nothing, you attributed these random events in your life to me, much like I think believers do with God, and then you tried to learn something from them. So even though now you know it wasn't real, did you, did you take anything from the experience? It sounded like you did. I'm a huge worrier, so I've made a point now of not worrying so much. Um, I'm a bit more spontaneous now as well, um, and I make a point of seeing my friends more, which is something that I needed to do, so. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emma. Thanks. So, I'm reaching the climax of my attempts to give Natalie a strong and powerful religious experience. You've already seen me introduce the idea of a perfect father figure, elicit and combine feelings of awe and being cherished, and allow her to notice a grand plan in her life. I've also attached these feelings to the tapping of my finger so that I can bring them all back in an instant. I'm now going to leave her alone in the church so she can take it all in. And I'm hoping she will piece all of these together and have a powerful and very real experience. And what you're about to see now has no music or effects placed over it. Instead, I want you to experience what happened as it happened. Um, brilliant. I'm actually just going to nip out for uh, two minutes and leave you here, leave you here for a second. Um, uh, I th I th it's actually really, really interesting talking to you because I do think there are so many beliefs and I suppose new experiences, things that are new and surprising that could literally be sort of right in front of us and we don't even quite register that they're there until one day when we just stand up and then we feel that new thing which can be really rich and very powerful and right there and really, and really hit us in a very real way. Um, and we can surprise ourselves. Anyway, I'm going to come back in just one second. Thank you. Stretch your legs, you don't need to, you can, you know, get up okay. and move around if you like. break, we're going to meet Natalie.
Tonight, I've been looking at how psychological techniques can be used to explain why we believe in God. It was important, I felt, to show you that these techniques actually work and that this innate hardwiring we have really can give us a powerful experience of God without any need for him to exist. So I've used them to bring about a strong and powerful experience of a religious conversion in an atheist stem cell scientist called Natalie. <laughs> We're going to meet her in a bit, but first let's hear her initial reaction to the experience. Yeah, talk to me. Oh, good. Why couldn't I have had this all my life? <laughs> I'm saying, I've had moments where I felt complete awe at what I could see, you know. I've been to you know, music concerts where you leave it and you're just on such a high because the talent you've seen on stage has just blown you away. And oh, it's like the love, the love I get from my family, and my friends. <laughs> I just felt that times a thousand. When you st just when you stood up. <sighs> oh God! Oh God! <laughs> how do you feel when you think about God now compared to how you were earlier on when you came in? <sighs> like a uh, unconditional love that, that will always be there, no matter what. I don't yeah. know. Oh, it's so conflicting. <laughs> so you think it doesn't quite fit into your uh, sci scientific... Yeah. Mind, yeah, yeah mind. Ever the scientist. Oh, God. Do you want to go and get some... Actually, some water? Oh, water, please. Some water. Please. Some water. <laughs> Here's Natalie, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, now, we've kept you out of the way. You haven't been following anything that we've been talking about here. You don't know what this program has been about. Excellent. Um, but they have been following your story, and they've seen what's, what happened to you the other day. Can I just ask you, what was that moment like? When you stood up, because it was an extraordinary reaction, what, can you put into words what that felt like, that moment? It just felt as though all the love in the world had been thrown at me. and. It was completely overwhelming. I, 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 you saw I couldn't really handle it because it felt as though that love had always been available to me, but I kind of pushed it away or, or mistreated it somehow by not letting it into my life. Mm -hmm. It's as if my spectrum has just been broadened. You know, it, it's as if I have this barometer of emotion from really, really bad to really, really good, and that high end has just been extended. You, you said to me, um that day after we'd sort of finished filming, you said this has to be something supernatural because it wasn't anything well, that felt you could, yeah. you could explain. Technically, as a yeah. <laughs> yeah. textbook definition is something unexplained mm. is maybe supernatural, but again, because I don't believe in a supernatural, I'm still searching <laughs> to so identify that source. It must yeah, set totally, up yeah. conflicts, some conflicts yeah, in your mind. So you're still sort of searching through that by the sound of it. <laughs> still mulling over what happened nearly a week ago, yeah. Excellent. I feel duty bound to make sure that you don't leave this experience with a, with a religious belief that I've sort of just given you. Um, I think, but as I think the emotions and I think everything you've taken from it is hugely positive, but it's important to me that you can separate the emotions that you felt and everything positive that you've taken from this from, uh, from a religious belief. Mm -hmm. So let me explain to you what I did. I elicited feelings from you, emotions from you, but getting you to imagine a perfect father, um, uh, getting you to imagine a sense of awe, and as I asked you about those things, as you kind of internally found those states, as I asked you what it would feel like, I started tapping on the table, and in the same way that if you listen to a song, it can take you back to, um, you know, remember, when you I broke do up. remember the tapping, I'm you remember thinking, the tapping, is he yeah. bored? <laughs> is it, I'm a bored, no, I'm from it. But every time you did that, every time I tapped, I was starting to associate those feelings with the tap. Like, as I say, when you listen to a song, when you've broken up with somebody, and then you yeah. hear the song again years later, it makes you immediately feel terrible. Exactly the same idea. And I was building on that throughout. I also introduced um, the idea of faith 
to you as a positive thing. I started to reframe it as something that could be positive. I introduced the idea of agency in your life, the idea that there could be a plan. These were subtle things. I never mentioned God, but I was bit by bit just giving you these, uh, these thoughts and feelings one at a time and stealing all the emotions with this tap. And then when I stood up, I said you can take all of those images in your head and I sort of, I did this, I sort of showed you them in front of you like that so that if you were to stand up you'd actually walk through them. And I said that some people do stand up and feel this uh, and I tapped, I tapped on the table leaving you with that suggestion which is entirely unconscious so it's not something you'd be processing or thinking about, you wouldn't know I was doing it but your unconscious is picking up on all of those things. When you did stand up it simply triggered off those emotions that I'd given you all in one very powerful moment which is the experience, pretty much, of a religious conversion. Me telling you that now, does that devalue it? It has added a kind of artificial element to it for me now. Okay. Um, but again, I suppose inducing an emotional reaction to something, if it's to external influences, it's always artificial in a way, you know. If it's from listening to an amazing piece of music, that's an mm. emotional stimulus that's come from an artificial source so exactly. it's, it's all um, the emotions are real that's yeah. the point it's just important to me that you don't feel it has to be attached to something supernatural or superstitious because it wasn't okay. and it's not even like it came from me it certainly didn't come from god it just it came from you and those are real perfectly real real emotions that as you said have expanded now your emotional repertoire and things that you can now carry with you for the rest of your life but you don't need to attach them to anything superstitious it's important that i leave you with that knowledge so you're not being fooled by anything right that's that's important but natalie thank you very very much indeed thank you for doing this and thank you for coming in. thank you um, i think i think the most honest answer to the question why do you believe in god is because it makes me happy there's no reason to argue with that we all find ways of making ourselves happy and understanding religious experience as a human process is, to me, far more resonant and, 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 and a more beautiful approach because it's real and it shows how astonishing we are and what emotional riches we are capable of. We each live an extraordinary and improbable life. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, all of you. And thank you for watching at home. Good night.